My name is Jessica Marston with Tiger Media Network, and I'm here joined by Dr. Murda Martin. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for taking the time to meet with us. Thank you for having me. First off, tell me a little bit about your childhood. My childhood. Well, you know, my childhood was in stages. I was born in Cuba, and uh, shortly after my birth, the communist regime fell into power. So my family um, thought that it was just going to be a fad. As a matter of fact, one of these days, I'm going to write a book, and the title is going to be, The Americans Will Never Let a Communist Nation 90 Miles from Their Shores. But unfortunately, they did. And when the frontiers were opened, my family um, had to petition the Cuban government, uh, once the frontiers were closed, to be able to leave the country. And so the permission came from my grandmother, my sister, and me. And the government chose who was going to leave, when, and by what route. And so the three of us were chosen, and we went via Spain, which was my grandmother's birthplace. Uh, we left with the clothes on our back, and um, really on a leap of faith. And um, uh, a convent of nuns was actually who came to pick us up at the airport. My grandmother's family had been beneficiaries and benefactors of uh, this order of nuns. And so they had built a small little apartment, well, not even an apartment, a room in their convent. And we thought that my family would leave and join us. Many years later, we were still living in the convent. <laughs> and so I grew up in Spain. And when we realized that the family was not able to leave, we were advised by the American government and the embassy that perhaps if we immigrated to the United States, that we could achieve that dream. And so we started the paperwork and eventually uh, arrived here in Miami, in Miami Beach, and settled there. I did high school uh, in Miami. And shortly before I was getting ready to go away to Duke, uh, my mother and my two brothers were able to leave the, Cuba, the, the, the island. Um, regrettably, the rest of the family stayed behind and died behind. And uh, my father is the only one who remains, and he's still in Cuba. He's able to come and visit every two to three years, and we're thankful for that. Uh, so my childhood has been very fragmented, but it really has given me an understanding of the importance of education, and that's why I'm here. Uh, what is your earliest memory as a child? my earliest memory as a child. Um, probably the most vivid memory I have as a child is when we left Cuba. I was about five years old, six, and um, the government separated the families so that even they could not be together and, until the very end. And, and they put the families who were leaving Cuba because we were not allowed to, or they didn't want us to leave, behind a fishbowl, if you would. You know, there was a glass, and the family who was staying was on the other side, one side, and the family who was living on one side. And I remember uh, my brothers, who were one and two, putting their fingers against the glass. Um, it, was, it was very difficult. That's probably the, the earliest memory I have. In school, what was your favorite subject and why? I love languages. Um, when I went to Spain, you know, I, I speak four languages. I came to the States and I didn't speak a word of English. And everybody kept saying, how could you not speak English when you speak all these other languages? Well, because in Spain you did it by geography. You know, you, you, as you uh, went to school and you learned how to write Spanish they were teaching you how to speak French. Then by the time you learn how to write Spanish, then they were shifting, they were teaching you how to speak Portuguese and how to write French. And so it's congruency, you know, the neighboring countries. So I love languages, not just for the language itself, but because it opened the world to other cultures and other peoples and the ability to converse and understand who they were. Um, so that was probably my, that's probably my favorite subject. Did you have a favorite teacher or a teacher that you most admired? 
I had many of them. Um, you know, in, in Spain, the nuns were teachers, and they were incredible. Uh, they had a life of service, and they exemplified all that is good and, and in the world and, and passing it on to others. And that's where I started to create and solidify those values by which I live today of integrity, of honor, of passing it on to others. Um, once I came to the States, uh, there was a, a especially um, one lady, uh, Mrs. Rosenberg. She decided she was going to take me under her wing because while I wanted to go to college and I knew that I needed to go to college, I didn't know how to go to college. And Mrs. Rosenberg taught me how to apply, when to take the SATs, how to discern to what school I should apply to, and even wrote the checks to get me to college. So she made a tremendous difference in my life. Wow. And she's now gone, so. Okay. What does the word family mean to you? Family is heart. Family is home. Family is the place that I want to be, is, is being surrounded by individuals who we may not always agree to, we may agree to disagree at times, but we are all bound by a certain feeling of, of unity, of, um, of commitment, of dedication, of loyalty and, and support to each other. Um, you know, and family doesn't have to be necessarily blood. I, when I was visiting here, I was touched by the dedication of the family of Fort Hay State University. And that's what I was looking for, for the next stage of my life is, is that family, is that home. It's a place where I feel that we're united by a bond, not just blood. Um, could you describe a little bit more about your family? Um, well, my, my blood family, I, um, I um, was raised by a grandmother, as I share with you, who has now passed. And I had a, another one, my paternal grandmother. I, I speak to both of these ladies because they probably did a, were incredibly forceful and had an incredible influence in my life. One gave me freedom, uh, the other one strengthened my values and, and my faith, um, and they have both passed. Um, my father, as I said, remains in Cuba. I have a mother who lives in Miami. And I now, I'm married to my college sweetheart. John and I met uh, first week, freshman week in college. And as you well know, when you go to college, you are hooked to each other's roommates. So my roommate was on the gymnastics team and John's roommate was on the men's gymnastics team. They met and so the four of us became a foursome. By Christmas we were dating and four years later, a week after we graduated, we were married. Um, we have two children and, and of course he's from Virginia so we moved to Virginia where we've made our home for the past 30 years. Uh, we have two children. Catherine is 25 and she is a doctoral student a uh, PhD student in uh, developmental psychology for neuroscience at the University of Miami. And Patrick is a rising fourth year, a rising senior at the University of Virginia. And um, they're wonderful kids. They are very much, much committed to passing it forward. And I think that's the greatest thing that I can say about them. They made me very proud because they've embraced that value of it's not what's in it for them, but how they can improve the human condition. Can you uh, tell me a little bit more about your college experience? How did you come to uh, be at Duke? Well, uh, as I share, we, we discern which were the schools that were most likely suited to be able to do what I wanted to do. And at the time, I was pre-med, actually. And um, Duke seemed to be the one that had a sense of family, a sense of unity. I, I will tell you that being Spanish, it took an act of God to let my grandmother leave the home because culturally, and especially girls, may only leave the home in a white dress. So allowing me to leave 
Miami Beach to go all the way out to Carolina um, was nothing short of a miracle. Um, but it was the right place. It was small enough at a time that it provided me that sense of unity that and home that we were looking for. My grandmother felt that I would be safe there. So that's how I ended up at Duke. Mm -hmm. You said you studied pre-med. What um, made you change and go into higher ed? Well, you know, it, um, it, it's just life, I guess. I was part of an early identification program for medical students, and I was working on, on a floor, and I had been assigned to a child's, to the children's oncology ward. And I remember walking in every day and, and these children who were fighting cancer were just filled with life, but they were fighting cancer. And I walked in one day and this, this young boy had gone code blue. And I remember the medical students and the doctors trying to revive him. And I broke down. I just couldn't take it. I, I just, and I went to my advisor and I said, I, I, I can't do this. I, how can you choose not to? Well, the medical students were, were kind of having a personal conversation, if you would, while they were trying to revive the child. So they were going one, two, three. So what did you do this evening? Three, four, five, six. Well, I went out to dinner and I, share my concerns with my doctor and he said you've got to understand that you've got to separate yourself because for very many of them that you can save there'll be lots that you can't and you know I understood that but I couldn't detach myself from the child and so I actually um, so when John and I uh, got married I actually uh, ended up starting my career in the banking system because I had the financial background. I had a very broad liberal arts background and I always speak to the fact, actually now I'm oftentimes asked to give keynote speeches as to why does a business person or a business dean, why do you think liberal arts is important? Well, because it's the bedrock of education. You know, it, uh, employers today want individuals who can write well, who can speak well, who can synthesize, who can execute, who have a broad foundation. And that's what liberal arts education does. So my education at Duke served me well. And I entered the, the business world in the banking industry and did very well there. And I'm very thankful that I have that foundation as I continue into my career into higher ed. How did your college experience uh, prepare you for your job as the president of Fort Hayes? You know, I, I, it's not just the college experience. I think it's a combination of the sum total of your life experiences. I can identify with most people. Um, at Duke, I was working full time while going to school full time, you know. You work, and just like you and I were discussing earlier, you had to keep up your grades, mm -hmm. you know? So um, there was not much time for parties and everything else, and, and I was thankful because John is an engineer, so he would be stuck in the engineering labs, and we would make time to be with each other for breakfast, lunch, or dinner because Duke is a residential community, um, and that's how we, we saw each other. So I understand the plight of students. When we got married, we were very young, we were working full time, and I was going back to school as a non-traditional student. You know, so again, I understand the plight of the non-traditional student who has the demands of family life, who has the demands of trying to, at the time, climb corporate, create a career, and still go to school. Then, the children were born. I continued on my career and my grandmother, after I finished my master, said, well, you know, you're used to going to school one day a week and studying one day a week and being at the library one day a week. Why just not continue? So I thought, well, okay, I'll continue. And so 
um, I started with my PhD. Uh, I was pregnant at the time, and Patrick was born on the first exam of, fresh, of my first year in the spring. To this day, that professor who then became my dissertation advisor, and to this day as a mentor, Dr. Fairholm, calls Patrick my fourth credit. <laughs> because actually, Patrick, I went into labor at that exam, and he looked up and he said, you're all on the honor code. Would somebody get this woman to the hospital? And so Patrick was born. So, you know, I understand what it takes as a student, as well as a professor, to, to be a president because I can identify with people. From there, you know, having gone into industry, I understand the needs of industry and the fact that academia and industry must work together because they are the recipient of our product, of you, you know? So we need to create a pipeline of talent to ensure that our product, our students at four days, State University and throughout the nation have meaningful employment. So from industry, been there, done that. From academia, been there, that, done that, not just a, as a student, but as a faculty member and then into administration. So it gives me a unique perspective to be able to guide this wonderful school. What brought you to Fort Hayes and why did you choose Fort Hayes? When I was looking to find a home, I have read several profiles for university presidents. And what caught my eye about Fort Hayes was that in the profile of what they were looking for at the time for the next leader was someone who had a strong work ethic and who wanted to lead in a caring community. And that describes me. I have a very strong work ethic and I want to be part of a caring community. And so in, it immediately caught my eye. So then I did the due diligence and I started to do the research and the website and the website is phenomenal. I got an awful lot of information and visited with you on the videos and everything else that was around. And I thought, yes, this is a place that I could call home. And then I got the phone call that said, okay, so you made it to the airport interview. And so I arrived in Kansas City and got a car and drove all the way here and got lost an awful lot. And I would say, so I'm looking for, could you tell me? <laughs> And, you know, and I would have an opportunity to speak with people because, you know, I needed to feel that this would be a place that I could call home. And I've been, this is my fifth time now, and I know I've called home. It's, the, the people are incredible. You know, I say it's a magical place because they are. People are genuine. They are caring. They're committed. Um, they want to embrace a sense of family because everybody treats each other as though they were family. We are a family, you know, and it's a place that I can make a difference. I can make an impact. So I'm thrilled to be here. What are some of the positive things you see happening here at Fort Hayes? Everything uh, that's happening here at Fort Hayes is positive. It's the energy, it's the enthusiasm, it's the entrepreneurial spirit of if I can dream it, I can see it and I can make it happen. It's the fact that there are no barriers or obstacles to the American ingenuity. There are no obstacles to bringing dreams into reality and creating them and passing it forward for the next generation of leaders. You know, it's not about me, it's about you. It's about ensuring that you, as the next leader of this country, has access to the American dream that I so embrace and so e exemplify. And that's what here at Fort Hayes State University, everyone is committed to that. And that makes us very unique. What some uh, challenges or improvements do you see happening as you move into your presidency? You know, that's a really tough question because um, I, I'm not here yet, okay? Mm -hmm. I have actually spoken to quite a bit of people uh, because as I shared with the family of Fort Hayes State University when 
I was interviewing, I want to hear from you. I want to see what you see. I want to feel what you feel. Um, I will tell you that we will continue steadfastly in support of the mission, being a embracing our familial values, um, making sure that we are student-centered, because again, it's not about us, it's about you. It's about creating a pipeline for the next generation of leaders to have access to the American dream and to be successful. So we will begin to get together and create a plan that involves you as a student, that involves you as a part of the community of administrators, of faculty, of staff, of industry leaders, so that we know where to go, expanding our footprint throughout the world, never compromising excellence, and never compromising those values that have made us unique. What advice do you have to either future or current students? If you can believe it, you can become it. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It may take you longer. You may have to work for it harder. But if you set your heart and your mind, there's nothing that you cannot achieve. Well, thank you, Dr. Martin, for sitting down with us thank once you. again.